Good morning, everyone. Turn in your Old Testaments, please, to the second book of Kings, 2 Kings chapter 5, 2 Kings chapter 5. Thanks so much for tuning in to our live stream broadcast uh, here at the Bel Air Church. We're thankful for your presence, and for those of you that are visiting, we welcome you to our worship, and we pray and hope that it has been enlightening to you and beneficial uh, and increased your confidence in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We often enjoy eating uh, a meal in our backyard. Um, I, for one, love my backyard because it's, uh, not that it's that big, but we have a pool back there. And I guess what sold me on the house was the back porch area. It covers the whole length of the house, and it, it's, it's pretty wide. But anyway, we use about half of it a whole lot of the time. We have several swings uh, that are positioned on the back porch, facing kind of each other, but also facing the pool. And Muffy has set plants all around us, beautiful green plants and flowers and such as that. It's a very calming uh, type of environment, and I find myself going to it uh, quite often. And we eat out there. Uh, we eat out there a lot. In fact, this morning, we had our breakfast out on the back porch. But there's one thing. There's one barrier. There's one wall. There's one problem that keeps the back porch from being just perfect. And I'll tell you what it is. It's mosquitoes. And those pesky little flies that are flying all over the place... And nine times out of ten, I got to have a fly swatter out there. They're everywhere. I'm trying to eat my food and drink, and they're trying to land on all my stuff, and it drives me completely crazy. We have tried all kinds of remedies. None of them seem to work. Now, this is a silly example, I know. But most of us have been in this situation in a very serious way. We all know what it's like to think. Life would be so good, except this one thing that I cannot overcome. This one obstacle that I have to always face that stands between me and fulfillment. Maybe that obstacle is your weight. I've fought it my whole life. I understand the fact that my body's a holy temple. And that I must keep it uh, as healthy as I possibly can. It it may be a bad relationship that you're having to face. It may be something to do with your health, some kind of a health concern. It could be a number of things. But whatever it is, this gigantic barrier sits between you and the life that you want to live. Maybe you sincerely desire to follow our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And maybe you want to be exactly like him, but there is this one issue, this spiritual issue that keeps knocking you down. It keeps getting in your way. There's this one sin, this one issue that is the real pest. It's the one that you constantly have to fight. It keeps getting the best of you. Now, maybe that might be your temper. Maybe it's your tongue. Maybe it's lust. And you have to fight that all the time. You've got to fight that lust. The things that you see, the things that you hear. Maybe it's your pride. This has created a wall between you and holiness. Maybe some of you have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you've heard it a number of times. Maybe you've heard it in this auditorium. And it has worked on your heart. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 comes to my mind. For the word of God is living and it's active And it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, 
and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You see, that issue, that sin issue has cut deep into your soul. It won't let you go. It stands before you all the time. Your conscience burns inside of you. Have you felt that? I can tell you I felt that. Your conscience burning inside of you. And it won't let go. And you understand what the scriptures teach. You understand what truth requires of you. And that is to be spiritually clean. And thank you very much, Brian, for an excellent, Devotion, so that we can prepare ourselves properly to partake of the Lord's Supper. But you know the steps to fulfill obedience to God. You know that. You understand it. Well, today we're going to look at the story of a man who was in this situation. This one big barrier situation. This fellow was wealthy. He was extremely successful. He was influential. Except for one thing that kept him from having it all. And this story, in this story, he breaks through that wall. And in that process, he learns a lot about himself. And he learns a lot about God. The God of Israel, the God of Jacob, and the Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This story is about breaking down our own barriers. It's about maturing um, to the stature of God's child. It's the story of a man named Naaman. And it's found in 2 Kings chapter 5. And I hope you're there. I want to read verse 1 first. The king of Aram had great admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army. Because through him the Lord had given Aram great victories. But though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy. That was the one big issue plaguing him. Constantly in front of his face. He had leprosy. Leprosy is a highly contagious skin disease. It is a terrible disease. When you are infected with leprosy, it's just horrible. It's, it's incurable. It's loathsome. It's, it's, it's humiliating. It's disgusting. And there is a good chance... That if you're around anybody, you're going to infect others. So you stay away from people. You can't hug your children. You can't kiss your wife. You can't even shake hands with your friends. Sounds familiar. Naaman was not Jewish. Naaman was Syrian. In the Jewish culture, it was required for lepers who entered the public arena to identify themselves. What they would do is they would shave their hair off of their head. They would wear torn clothes. They would shave their beards, no beards. And they would yell out when they came near someone, unclean, unclean. Maybe someone happened upon them in this loathsome, terrible state. They would say, unclean, to warn those who might come near. To keep them away from, from their condition, from their illness. Can you imagine, ladies and gentlemen, having to do that today? Can you imagine it? I want you to stop and think. In any situation, can you imagine how you would feel? When people approach you and you had to warn them with, with certain words, warn them of, of the issues that you are facing, warn them of how contagious and, and destructive and deadly that you have the potential to be. 
Warn them. I am bitter. Don't come close to me. I'm angry. I, I'm, I'm vindictive. In my heart, I am jealous. I, I'm unfaithful. I'm greedy. I'm dishonest. I am selfish. Can you imagine that? These are terrible indicators of spiritual illness. They're symptoms of spiritual illness that we carry with us. And they are infectious. And we need our Savior, Jesus Christ, to cleanse us of these things. Because they will kill us. They will spiritually destroy us. Naaman was a successful warrior. And yet he was facing an enemy that could not be defeated. The one thing, this one thing, was enough to bring this great man down. And yet this one thing was enough to get him pointed in the right direction. See, that's what I see in this wonderful story. This was something that Naaman did right. Before leprosy ruined him, he did something right. He sought help. Now, I want you to think about this, ladies and gentlemen. Maybe you're facing an obstacle that, that hasn't ruined you, but has the potential to ruin you. Maybe it's some sin. Maybe it's some problem, some situation. But it hasn't gotten as bad as it can get. You've got to come to the conclusion that now is the time to confront it. Now is the time. You've got to take action now before it's too late. And I can assure you that it hasn't gotten as bad as it can get. If you realize that you're in a situation that it's a horrible situation, a barrier between you and God, take action now. The longer you avoid it, the worse it's going to get, the bigger it's going to become. Today is the day to begin taking the steps that Naaman took to break down the barriers that stand between you and the life God has in store for you. I want to read the four, first 14 verses because there may be some of you that don't know this story. This is one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture. Verse 1, chapter 5, 2 Kings, chapter 5, verse 1. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians, on one of their raids, had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel. And she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, Would that my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his Lord, Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman, my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he's seeking a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean. 
But Naaman was angry. And he went away saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hands over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. But his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. Here are three things we're going to discuss, three things that we can learn from Naaman about how to destroy obstacles that are plaguing you in your life. First of all, we need to humble ourselves and we need to listen to others' advice. Now, you will notice that two times in this story, Naaman was able to do the right thing because he knew who to listen to. A slave girl. Listen to who he listens to. A slave girl that is in his house, a Hebrew slave girl and the army officers who served under him. Now let's talk about the Hebrew slave girl for just a minute. I love this, this little girl, and I guarantee you one thing, she was raised by godly parents, I can tell you that. And let me tell you how I know that. She cared enough to speak up. She knew about Elisha the prophet and the power of God Almighty. She cared enough to speak up, and she had faith enough to believe Elisha could heal this man of his leprosy. Unbelievable. A slave girl. Let me tell you something else I admire about Naaman. Sometimes help comes from unexpected places. And he understood this principle. And we need to understand it too. If we're not willing to listen to others, we're going to miss out on a ton of opportunities, ladies and gentlemen. Naaman could have said, what wisdom could this little slave girl possibly have that would help me to get rid of this incurable nightmare of a disease called leprosy? What knowledge could she possibly possess? Who is she to tell me how to be healed of leprosy? Well, I'll tell you something. He knew about the Israelites. He fought them in 1 Kings, if you want to go back there and look. He fought in one because of God's hand. He was aware that the Israelites served a powerful, miracle-working God. He knew that firsthand. And he knew that living in the land were great prophets. This was not hidden this was nothing that was in the corner. And with all that on his mind, I can just see him. Hmm. Maybe she's right. It's worth a try. And so he begins to make plans. He begins to think about this and make plans. And those plans ultimately led to Elisha. Now later in the story, when Naaman overreacts, some of the men serving under him, they spoke up. There were two, the Hebrew servant girls and the men that worked underneath him. And they reasoned with him. And Naaman changed his attitude. And why is that? Because he had given others permission to speak to his issue. Thank God for faithful subordinates who will speak to their superiors boldly. Kindly and with care. Have you known someone who's been in a difficult situation and what they needed was just so completely obvious to you? You, you knew what they needed, but they just couldn't see it. They, they couldn't focus in on it. Hey, have you known someone like that? I'll tell you. 
I've been that way. I just couldn't see. It wasn't clear to me. Sometimes, you, maybe, I know I have gotten too close, too emotionally involved in a situation to have a proper perspective. Sometimes, you don't always see what you need to see. It's just not apparent. But other people viewing from a distance, they can sometimes see what you can't. Do you have courage? Do you have wisdom? Do you have humility enough to recognize that others sometimes have more insight than you do? I want you to stop and think about that. I want you to look introspectively. I want you to look in the mirror. Do you give these people permission to speak to you, to speak to your heart, to speak from their heart? If you give them permission to speak, it will give you leverage, ladies and gentlemen, over your problems. I just believe that with all my heart. Now, I'm talking about people that you respect and that you love and that you know. And sometimes even those that you don't know. If you stop and let what it is they are saying reside in your, bread, uh, your brain for longer than three seconds. Why? Because none of us are as smart as all of us. None of us are as smart as all of us. We all need outside input. We all need wisdom. That, that comes from the experience of others. We all need encouragement. I need this. You need this. And that's why Solomon said, and I just love this because it is just so true. Plans fail for lack of counsel. But with many advisors, they succeed. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 22. Now, do you have barriers and walls erected in your life? Start listening to those around you. Start asking for the wisdom and the advice of others that you respect. How many of you have taken the time to sit down and get to know Brian and Mike? Do you think it's only their responsibility to pursue you? Get to know them. They're wise. They've been through a lot in their life, and they know the scripture. They can help you. Start listening. Listen for those who can help you break those barriers, those walls that are erected in your life. Be humble enough to seek help. Naaman told his king about the prophet in Israel who might be able to heal him. And the king encourages him. He says, he says go, <laughs> go. I mean, if, if, if these people can help you, go. This is a nightmare that, that, that you're involved in right now. And I'll tell you what, I'll give you an introduction letter, okay? I'll, I will give you a formal letter to give to the king of Israel. So, so Naaman approaches the king of Israel and guess what? He was not well received. Not at all. Naaman went and knocked on his door, but he was not well received. In fact, the king of Israel thought it was a big trick. Just a big trick to give Aram an excuse to invade his country. Naaman knocked on the wrong door. It's really sad though. And we'll find out why it's sad in just a minute. But the king of Israel didn't see the possibilities of the opportunity. He couldn't see it. He couldn't visualize it. All he saw was a king trying to make a fight. He didn't say, well, well here's a chance to seal my friendship uh, with the king of Aram. Here's an opportunity. Let's call on God to heal this man. Let's call Elisha. Let's call the prophets. Bring them here. Let's heal him. And then we won't have a reason to fight anymore with Aram. He didn't see the opportunity. He just saw it as a threat. 
And I'm sure Naaman saw it as a closed door. Here's the thing. Naaman didn't let that get him down. He was willing to keep knocking on others' doors. Especially when he heard that there was a prophet not far away. A prophet that was willing to see him and hear of his condition. Now, in response to the king of Israel's proclamation and anger, this is what Elisha says to the king. Why, why are you so upset? Send Naaman to me, and he will learn that there is a true prophet here in Israel. He will learn. Doesn't that sound like that, that Elisha is a, a bit full of himself? Kind of? I don't believe he was full of himself, not at all. I don't believe he was arrogant. Elisha knew where the power came from, you see. He had a full understanding of where the power was. His faith was in Jehovah, our God. There is no greater power and he knew this firsthand. And he didn't want to miss an opportunity to see God demonstrate his power in this man's life. That's what he wanted to see. And he knew that that would have a great impact upon the people of Syria. And I'll tell you something else. He didn't want to miss the opportunity to be used by God. Do you want to be used by God? Do you pray that he will use you? Do you pray that he will give you opportunity to help others, to teach others the gospel of Jesus Christ, to have an influence on other people? And so what is it that Elisha says to the king? Send him to me. My experience as a football coach, I coached high school football for one year. But my experience with that game is this. Winners always want the ball. Winners always want the ball. When the game is on the line, there will be someone like the king of Israel that will say, well, this isn't for me. Find someone else. And there will be some like Elijah who say, give me a chance to prove what can be done. This is Elisha. Give me the chance. Give me the opportunity. If you want to break through the barriers in your life, you're going to need to invite the help of other people. This is what I have learned. When you encounter those who, like the king of Israel, say, well, this isn't my problem. This is an impossible situation, and I don't want anything to do with it. When you come across people like that, just move on. But in your movement, as you move away, keep knocking on doors until you find your Elisha. Providence, ladies and gentlemen, will answer that door. I believe that. God will provide the solution to your issue if you keep knocking. Knock on the door. If you want to break through the barriers that exist between you and a life that God has for you, you need to give people permission to speak to your issue. They may have a perspective that you haven't considered. We need to have faith that God will provide the door. We need to have faith that God's going to provide the person behind the door. Be humble enough to seek help. And third, and last, expect obedience to be a part of the solution, not just a gift with no conditions. When Naaman called on Elisha and knocked on his door, did Elisha come to the door? Now, you ought to understand, this whole barrage, this parade of people are accompanying this general in the Syrian army, this would be somebody like Eisenhower or Patton or somebody like that, okay? 
they had an entourage, you know, they, they, they had a following. All these people were coming, okay? And, and Naaman walks up to the door. This is a dignitary. He walks up to the door, then he knocks on the door, and Elisha doesn't even come to the door. He just sends a messenger. That's it. He just sends a messenger. Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River, and thank you very much for coming by. Talk to you later. Whack. Hope things go well for you. <laughs> go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. This is the message from the messenger, not Elisha, that was given to Naaman. Do this and your skin's going to be restored and you'll be healed. Well, I'm going to tell you what, this wasn't good enough for Naaman. Because Elisha's request was so easy to do and so humbling, Naaman refused. His ego got in the way. You know, this just is not happening the way that I pictured it. Now I want you to read verse 11 if you have your Bibles open, but if not, you can look on the screen. But Naaman began angry, became angry and stalked away. I thought, well, that's part of the problem. Instead of, I will obey, I thought. I thought he would surely come out to meet me. For crying out loud, I'm a dignitary here, you know. I'm, I'm second in command of all of Syria. I've got all these people here, and, and this guy didn't even come to the door. I expected him to wave his hand over me. I want some magic or something showing up here, some clouds building and some lightning striking, you know, and some earth breaking open and some kind of, uh, you know, eruption to occur. And, and I, I, I want him to call on the name of the Lord, his God, and have him heal me with a strike and a bolt of lightning. And then after this, with all this complaining, Instead of just going down to the Jordan River, after all this, he, he keeps on complaining. And what is it that he says? Well, hell, wait a minute. I don't want to go wash in that nasty, muddy Jordan River. Are you kidding me? Aren't the Abana River and the Far Far River of Damascus better than all the rivers of Israel put together? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? Why do I have to go to that muddy, nasty Jordan River? So what does Naaman do? All worked up and angry, beside himself, he turns away and off in a rage he goes. Complaining about the river. Complaining about that dirty water. Isn't this crazy? Isn't it crazy, but, but isn't it classic? Stop and think about it. It's just classic. Naaman is on the verge of something spectacular, ladies and gentlemen, something absolutely spectacular. He has the chance to be healed of this dreaded, nasty nightmare of a disease that is absolutely destroying his life. And instead of obeying, he gets mad because Elisha didn't do it right. Elisha didn't do it the way he wanted to. Elisha didn't do it the way they do it on TV. Naaman wanted to show. God didn't work the way he expected. He wanted a prophet to come out because after all, you know, I mean, I'm a general, I'm, I'm a dignitary. I want to just watch in amazement. After all, I'm here. I knocked on the door. I listened to the Hebrew little girl. Naaman wanted to do nothing but receive cleansing. That's it. His way. No action on his part. No effort on his part. No acts of obedience on his part. No follow through on his part. Just stand there and be entertained. And be healed. You know what? That's not how we break through obstacles. That's not how you get right with God. There's a part of us that 
wished that God would, would send someone along and wave his hand over us and make all our problems go away. Right? To just make them all go away. I, you can do that, God. It'd be real simple. Just come, have somebody come over the house and maybe just pray a simple prayer. You know? Pray it for me. Some kind of words to say, maybe. That's not how it works. That is not how it works. Just like Elisha told Naaman to wash seven times in the river, God tells us the steps necessary to be washed clean spiritually. We know. The scripture is complete. It's thorough. We know exactly what God wants us to do. He wanted Naaman to wash seven times in the river. Jordan River. What does he want us to do? He wants us to be washed clean in the water, baptized into Christ, immersed in water and raised to, to walk clean. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. For the remission of sin. To get rid of of the nasty, humiliating, destructive power of sin. Acts chapter 22, verse 16. What was it that Ananias said to Saul? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. All you have to do is go to the baptistry. After you've believed with all of your heart, which has is, is caused you to move in the direction of God, you're trying to find Him, you want to get your life right, and you repent, you turn away. Except you repent, Jesus says, you'll all likewise perish. You repent, you turn. You confess the fact that Jesus is the Christ. And then Scripture says that you are to be baptized. You are to be baptized to wash away your sins. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 tells us what else baptism does. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You put him on. When you're baptized into Christ, you literally clothe yourself with Jesus Christ. And 1 Peter 3 verse 21 is just as clear as crystal. For baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but an answer of a good conscience towards God. What do we want? Does it make you angry? That God Almighty has asked you to, to be immersed, to be cleansed? Does that make you angry? Do you have a problem with that because everybody on TV doesn't do it that way? Now, I got to tell you something. That's not the cleanest of, of all bodies of water back there, okay? <laughs> I'm going to tell you that because I've been in it a bunch of times baptizing folks. All right, there's nothing glamorous about washing yourself in the River Jordan seven times. Nothing glamorous about that. He had to go walk in that nasty, muddy thing, and he had to dip himself seven times. He's a dignitary. He's second in command of all of Syria. Neither is there anything glamorous about being baptized in a baptistry or in a river in any body of water. But I will tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. There is something powerful about it because it, re, re, it represents humble obedience to the word of God. That's the power. At first, Naaman, he, he objected to Elisha's instruction, the instructions. But as we pointed out already, he changed his mind when his servant spoke up. The, the people that loved him the people that cared about him. And then they started speaking sense to him. And he understood that, that he really needed to change his mind on them. And then he did what Elisha told him to do. 
The question I've got for you is, are you willing to obey? Are you willing to take those steps necessary that Scripture is so clear about? So Naaman went down to the Jordan River and dipped himself seven times. He finally did what God Almighty told him to do. He dipped in that river seven times as the man of God had instructed him and his flesh became as healthy as a young child's and he was healed. The question is, will you let others speak to you about your spiritual situation? Will you be honest with yourself and look into the words of God and just obey? Will you listen? Credible people love you. The people in this, this church, they, they love you. But, but let's take it a step further than that. Husbands, will you let your wife speak in your marriage? Will you let her speak? Will you listen? Wives, will you let your husbands get involved? Teenagers, will you allow your parents to speak and will you listen? Are you humble enough to hear what they have to say? Are you willing to knock on more than one door? to allow for God's providence to work in your life? Are you willing to keep trying even when others misjudge you or they offer you no hope? And are you willing to take steps necessary to see it through? Are you willing to obey the words of God? Truth, light, that's who he is. The true light. Are you willing to obey? Scripture is clear on what it is that we need to do to take responsibility for your actions rather than just waiting in faith for someone to come along and make all your problems go away, make all your sin go away. Or worse than that, making up your own recipe for salvation. Something that I, I never have been able to find in, in Scripture, nowhere, called the sinner's prayer. Where is that? Where, where people have to, to uh, go through this man-made uh, prayer of sorts, and, and then they're going to be cleansed. Well, let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. That's just like saying the rivers of Damascus, the Abana, and the Farpar rivers are much nicer than the Jordan River. They're much nicer. I'm going to go over there and I'm going to dip myself seven times in that. Why not just obey the gospel? Why not just respond to truth instead of trying to say some kind of some man-made quote-unquote sinner's prayer that's supposed to cleanse you? Or let me give you another example. Taking your kids up to some building and sprinkling them with water. Can you tell me where that is in scripture? Please. Where is it? Well, I thought he was going to, you know, strike with some lightning and come out with some earthquakes going on or something like that. Wave his hand over me. Sprinkle some water on me. And I'll be saved. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, for being so blunt about it. But seriously, there are people that I love who bring their children to a building to get them quote unquote, now I'm talking about babies, infants who have no sin. There is nowhere in scripture, it's just not there. And they sprinkle them with water some kind of way. That's not God's will. Are you willing to just obey? Are you willing to, to, to just take that step? The Jordan River doesn't have the power to heal leprosy or to cleanse us from our sins. That baptistry can't heal leprosy and that water can't cleanse your sin. But consistent obedience to the word of God does have the power to break any barrier of sin that exists in your life. Are you standing on the bank of the Jordan River this morning? Are you just standing there looking at it? You know that by obeying God's word, 
you'll be cleansed. Are you willing to take that step? Are you willing to listen to truth? Are you willing to act on the word of God? It's just that simple. We sing a song, Only a Step, here, invitation song. Only a step, only a step, come for he pleads for you. He's pleading for you this morning if you haven't obeyed the gospel of Christ, ladies and gentlemen. He's pleading with you because you are sick with an illness that cannot be cured unless you attend to his words. Are you ready to do that? Maybe some of you are ready to respond. And if you are right now, Call me on the phone. Call Brian on the phone. Call Mike on the phone. Call somebody. Because Scripture teaches us that when you are convicted, you need to act. Right then. There's water. We will find water around Houston, Texas, somewhere. So that you can be cleansed, clean, fresh, new just like a baby, sinless. Well, it was an honor to speak to you this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. We hope that each of you this morning will open your ears to God's truth and humble yourself and live obediently to it.